We had a living example of the point of tonight's lesson this morning. Ryan Riley led the singing. And if you've ever been here, when Tom Riley leads the singing, Ryan does it exactly like Tom. You notice that? And how many people notice that James leads it just like Phil? It's exactly like every time. And some people have had the audacity to say that Austin somehow mimics my preaching style. I'm not seeing it, but, you know, I think it's there anyway. You think about that for a minute. Just think about people that you know and how they are connected and notice how alike people become or are. I read the story of a fable of an island that had this fable about their village. And the mountain that overlooked their village had on it, from the vantage point of that village, what appeared to be the face of a man. And they would say throughout the decades and maybe centuries, someday there's a man coming that will look just like that face, and he will make a difference in our community. He will change our village. And the fable continues by saying, there was a boy who grew up at the base of that mountain, and he heard that fable all of his life, and he looked forward to the day when that face would appear in the form of a man who would change his village. And later in life, all the villagers looked at him and said, you look like the face on the mountain. Because he had looked at it for so long, thought about it so often, he became the face on the mountain. We talked about the concept, what's going on in the mind of one who practices idolatry. And of course, we need to make sure we understand that we've expanded the definition of idolatry from just a mere image and falling down to worship to the concept that anything that because of myself centered on me, focuses on material things, and in those things I find my self-justification. I, I give myself the right to let those things be my priority over God. The sad thing is that oftentimes we don't see it. We've been through some difficult times in the world. Many people have commented about the COVID pandemic and said that it caused so much damage to our world. Well, I think there's some truth to that. Financially, the world was damaged, certainly. The health of the world was damaged, certainly. But rather than saying that COVID caused so much, as it relates to the people that we are, I think COVID revealed so much. I'm not going to make a judgment call that health was not an issue. But I know this. Churches quit meeting 
and still are not meeting. In fact, they've closed their doors in many places. Do you know we have right now in churches of Christ 1,000 unfilled pulpits? 1,000 churches who don't have someone preaching for them, maybe outside of some men who just volunteer to do it. All of the churches with whom I have contact say they're not fully back, though we're getting there. I wonder, understanding that health is a real concern, it continues to be a concern. There are people who still have health issues that they are dealing with. I wonder if what we have been through has in some way revealed a mentality of idolatry in the hearts and minds of some people. I just wonder. For a few minutes, let's think about the practicality of this. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 is where I want to begin in a statement that Paul makes when he says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, notice, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul defined for these people idolatry as covetousness. And covetousness is a concept, a mentality that desires, looks for, wants, goes after that to which they have no right. It, it's more than just going after something. To covet is more along the lines of going after something while there might be some self-centeredness there. This is self-centeredness that goes after something that you have no right to go after in the first place. Nowhere better to find than when God said to his people in the Old Testament, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. So this covetous idea, which is idolatry, shows us what it is like practically to say, going after something for which we have no right. Well, just what does that mean? What is that idea? What is it about covetousness that we need to understand? Turn, if you will, to the text of Isaiah 40 that was just read for us. Quickly let me break it down to what it seems to be saying. Two things that I see. One, covetousness in idolatry or idolatry that we know to be covetousness is inspirational. That is, it is inspired from within this person. It comes from their own mind. Verse 18, what, a, what are you going to compare God to? You. And in the context it says they make their own thing, as we read this morning in chapter 44. They come up with the image in their own minds. They create this concept. I'm inspired to say, this is my image. I've often wondered, and maybe 
Maybe I just have overlooked it. But what inspired the Israelites to create a golden calf as their first image of God? I don't know. Aaron said they didn't create it. They just threw the gold in the fire and it burst forth. Of course, we know he lied. I don't know where the inspiration came from, but apparently that's what happened. Somebody has to be inspired. And number two, it's intentional. Notice how it reads. Verses 19 and 20 are saying the same thing based on two different types of people. The first one, verse 19, of the rich people. And the second one of the poor people, but they do the same thing. Notice, the rich. They have a workman that figures out the image. Then they get a goldsmith to put gold on it to make it beautiful. And then the silversmith comes along and creates chains for it. Some commentators say that the chains represent the images wearing chains around their necks because it's beautiful and nice. Most of them seem to say, and I think this is the right idea, they make chains to hold it securely to the wall so it doesn't fall over. The silversmith makes it last. It's an image in their own heads that looks the way they want it to look, and it lasts because they don't want to leave it behind. Well, look at the poor person. The poor person who doesn't have money just goes out and finds a tree that won't rot. It appears that he's not going to have the money to have gold put on it or silver. But he gets a piece of wood that's not going to rot, makes his image, and he still makes it, look at the end of verse 20, so that it will not totter. It won't fall over. Here's the idea. This covetous concept of idolatry comes from inside and says, I want this to be like I want it to be, look the way I want it, and I want it to last. Well, now let's be practical. When I view, looked at this word covetousness as it is used in the New Testament, I found six things, six different concepts for which the word covetousness is used and when you apply it or connect it to idolatry, here is what I find. The idols that we create look just like us. Our idols are made by us. And they look like us. And when people look at us, they might be led to think that our priorities might be out of order. That's possible. But certainly I need to look in the mirror to see if the image that I'm seeing in the mirror reflects me in an idol-loving way versus the way that God wants me to here are the six ideas connected to covetousness. Luke chapter 12. Here's something that is interesting to me. I think with all the things that Jesus did, all the things that he was involved with, here is a man that walks up to him and says, Jesus, would you tell my brother to share the inheritance with me? And, and I love how the, the text says that Jesus responded, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? I, 
have more important things to do than figure out who's going to get part of the inheritance. But he used it as an opportunity. Look at verse 15. You take heed and beware of covetousness. It is possible through our possessions that we might give off the impression that we idolize possessions or things. Now, I don't want to disparage the concept of riches. There are too many people in Scripture who are called rich, and therefore having stuff was not the issue. In truth, as we all know, we are a people who by world standards are rich. And so the idea of having things or having possessions, that's not the problem. That's not what Jesus was addressing. He's obviously talking about something else. There was a man who had a great successful harvest. And he had to tear down his old barns and build bigger ones so that he could keep all of that harvest. And then he said, what am I going to do? Eat, drink, be merry. And of course, he died. And it closes with the statement, so is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. We need to be people who do not idolize possessions. We cannot be people who are stuck on the stuff that we have. We don't need to be people who are known by our possessions. We need to be people who use possessions rather than have them to use us and certainly not to define us, but they can. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As you recall, Paul was going around collecting money for the time of famine relief in Judea. And he comes now to this chapter, and we find out that Paul is talking about ministering to the saints, verse 1. I boast about you, your willingness. I boasted about you in Macedonia. Uh, Achaia was ready a year ago. They, but I have sent brethren who boasted on your behalf. They can receive your money. These are people that wanted a long time ago to give to this. And Paul said, let's make sure we give it. You wanted to do it? I'm helping you. I'm going to help you find a way to give it here. Verse 5, therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be, notice, as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. You know what the word is there? Covetous. Same word. I'm sending someone to get the money that you promised so that it would be in generosity and not out of covetousness. The way we give could be an idol. Paul is reminding them, you wanted to do this. You had a willingness to do it. So I don't want it now to be something that becomes an obligation. How does a person covet by giving? Because I thought covetousness was trying to get what is not yours to get. Here's what I would say. If I'm giving to be seen, I'm trying to get something I don't deserve from the giving. If I'm trying to get recognition or be known for my giving, that's coveting a reputation. That's 
coveting appreciation. That's coveting someone patting you on the back saying, good job. I can't know that about you. But you can know it about yourself. And I can know it about me. The way I give could become an idol. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul is writing about who the Gentiles were starting in verse 17. And he says, these people being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with covetousness. In chapter 5, starting in verse 3, he talks further about them and begins in verse 3, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. There are things that I can do that can become my idols. The Gentiles had a lifestyle that gave them a reputation. And a, a lifestyle of an unclean way to live. And this is a broad word to cover sexual licentiousness. And I need to be careful, and you need to be careful, that we don't covet this type of thing that causes me to be unclean. What I do, the way I live, can be an idol if I would rather do this than do what God wants. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four, or chapter two, that is. Look what Paul says here. Paul is writing to them about coming to see them. Look at verse four. As we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. The way we talk could be an idol. The way we talk could be idolatry because we are falling at the feet of using flattering words because once again, we get feedback, we get attention, we get praise. We're able to deceive. We're able to get through a situation that might be difficult because I have the way to use words and, and move people's attention away from something that might get me in trouble. I could think of a lot of ways that we could talk and use words that actually could be idolatrous because we covet something that comes from those words for which we have no right. Two more, and both of them are in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. In verse 1, he talks about the false prophets among the teachers, among the people. And they're going to be false teachers among you. They're going to bring in secretly destructive heresies, denying the Lord who bought them, bringing on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed by covetousness. They will exploit you with deceptive words. The 
there have been, to my personal knowledge, for instance, preachers who by deceptive words, secret teaching, have split churches because the elders didn't catch it until the damage was done. It doesn't have to be the preachers. It could be individuals pushing their own agendas and causing disharmony among the people. And those who push their own agendas and their own teaching, even at the expense of someone else or a group, they're practicing idolatry. They're bowing before their own teaching as more important than anything else. Not able to say, I can handle it without being that way. The final one is in verse 14. Here we get to the root of the problem. All of these people that he mentions will perish in their own co corruption, verse 12. They receive wages of unrighteousness, verse 13. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions. Verse 13. They have eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin. Enticing stable souls. Notice. They have a heart trained in covetous practices. My heart can actually be idolatrous. Because in my heart of hearts, this is what I want. I think there have been many who in their lifetimes have left the truth. Because in their heart of hearts, they never were there anyway. We need to know what we believe and why we believe. And we need to establish our hearts so that we don't fall prey to the idolatry of covetousness and going after those things for which I have no right. And that's what idolatry is. Let us think. Do I have the right to act this way? To say this, to do this, to teach this? Do I have the right to be this way? And if I do, fine. But if I'm pushing my own agenda, my own desires, I am practicing modern day idolatry. It would not only hurt my soul, but it could hurt the souls of others that we might damage. We have a good group of people here who like to help each other. Maybe you need help. Maybe you need us to pray. Maybe you need us to be there for you to talk. We always want to do that. And in times like this, if you need our shepherds to meet with you, it can begin if you meet them at the front while we stand and sing together.